Okay, excellent. So welcome, Raf Tutz. We feel very privileged that we have you with us today um, and that you basically start our new year um, with a lecture from your side. Raf Tutz is director of the Global Division at UN Habitat and has been working in various positions at UN Habitat um, since the mid of the 19th, I've learned. Um, you've got also a university background. Uh, you worked at KU Leuven and also at the University of Nairobi, and you hold an honorary uh, um, a position uh, as an honorary professor at KU Leuven. Um, I don't maybe want to go too much into detail all the different positions you had in UN Habitat, but you were always, let's say, on the dot with very strategic um thoughts about what role will um urban planning and urban development uh, play and its normative guidelines and i think for us of very central interest is for sure also your engagement uh with regards to the sustainable development goals particularly in shaping sdg 11 uh, and i learned also that very recently Uh, you are part of debates on state of the world cities with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, which for sure is also of great interest to some of our students who are at the moment maybe doing some small projects within their courses with regards to this topic. So maybe there's also something uh, we, at least in the discussion, can take up. Um, Raf, I will not uh, take longer of your time. I would like to hand over to you and your presentation and uh, we later then come back for a joint discussion thank you thank you thank you so much Astrid, for the very kind introduction um i'm very pleased to be here to have uh, received this invitation it's always very engaging and very nice to be with students in a university setting which um I do only once in a while, but it's always uh, very, very interesting to see the engagement and the questions and answers. So um, I will, I will today focus on on um, the topic, really focusing on the role of the United Nations in promoting urban planning for sustainable development. It's um, it's a broad topic, and there will be uh, perhaps a lot of information. But I hope that we have a good exchange. Um, in the second half of this of this um, of this lecture, uh, I'm going to try my to try and share my screen right now. Yeah, it's starting to share. Okay, so then let me put the... Let's see, I, I'll let you know when I, we can see something. At the moment, it's still a black screen. Yes. Oh, now we see... Yeah. No, sorry, this is not the... Yeah. Do you see the PowerPoint? The yes, now I, now I can see it. Yeah, it was for a brief moment. It was just gray, but now we can see your title slide. All right, thank you so much. So let's let's get into it um, uh, straight away. Uh, I would like to cover four uh, topics. First of all, explain the relevance of um, urban planning uh, in the United Nations. For some of you, it may not be not be obvious why an organization that deals with um, with uh, Security Council, with uh, human rights issues and development and, um, and uh, humanitarian issues, why urban planning has been identified as a priority. And then I would like to, um, to highlight some global milestones, especially milestones um, of the history of urban development in, in um, development policy and especially the last five years and then uh, give some examples of our work or how we are applying this and then finally some lessons and conclusions 
So indeed, when people associate the United Nations with this building in, um, in New York, with the General Assembly, the Security Council, you may wonder why, you know, why urban planning comes even in mind of the member states that are uh, constituting the decision makers of the, of the United Nations. And um, I would like to start explaining this uh, in the following way. What you see on your screen here is um, uh, a picture of the Global Risk Landscape, uh, uh, which is a publication, a yearly publication by the World Economic Forum. And on the left side, you see the 2015 version. And at the bottom of that square, you see the failure of urban planning was identified by these respondents. It's like a global survey of people from industry, universities, and they identified the failure of urban planning as one of the uh, factors that has an impact on global risk. Not such as uh, a very high likelihood or a re reasonably like high likelihood and not such a big impact, but at least it is part of um, the weapons of mass destruction and uh, natural catastrophes and um, uh, you know, deflation and all, all types of, of issues that, that are, uh, that, that could have an impl influence on global risks. So that's, I think, an important thing. This was 2015 when we had this really avalanche of global agreements related also to sustainable urban development. What you see on the right side, and this is just to almost an anecdote, I looked at today, uh, at this um, report in January, and, and um, of course it looks at the, a survey of um, at the end of uh, 2019 and it was very clear that at that time nobody had seen the pandemic coming you see lots of concerns there about climate change climate action failure natural disasters but the um, uh, let's say infectious diseases came at the very bottom of the impact and you can see what happened since in the last uh, one year so this is also the relevant relative importance of uh, foresight by this distinguished group of uh, respondents. Anyway, what these people have in mind when responding is probably this. It's probably that urban planning uh, is failing in its, in its mission uh, of regulation, that uh, there's so much informal housing, uh, there is so much um, regulation that is not leading to good outcomes or that is uh, driving up prices or compromising other qualities of life. Uh, there is regulation that restricts mobility and regulation that uh, exas exacerbates inequality. And I think these are part of the reasons why so many people uh, five years ago found that urban planning is indeed a risk um, in the global uh, landscape. One of the elements that was not so much um, in the mind of these respondents is the inequality issue. And this is something that uh, we, uh, we are seeing as one of the major concerns nowadays, the inequality which is spatially uh, articulated very clearly in the, in the way cities are, are shaping up and growing. But there's another element to it is also the the investment in urban development, uh, which is sometimes going in the wrong direction, um, in the wrong place, the wrong size, the wrong design. And you see here a picture of four ghost cities that are hardly occupied, that have occupied a lot of financial investment, but are not yielding any quality of life or dividends at all. Um, a, a perhaps extreme example here is um, a city 30 kilometers from Tehran in, um, in Iran, and um, this is only occupied for less than 10 percent uh, after um, 20, more than 20 years of, of its existence. Because it's too far, it's not suitable to um, the, what people expect, where their employment is, et cetera. And so these are some of the, the real failures of urban planning made very uh, visible. So what happens when urban planning fails? And I've put here three types of um, impacts. Um, 
which are the essentially the three dimensions of sustainable urbanization, the economic, the social and the environmental impact. And I'm sure you must have seen this in, in your courses uh, so far. Um, there are clear uh, impacts at these three levels. And sometimes we only look at one of these three lenses, at the environmental lens, at the social lens, but it's very important with the emergence of urban planning in the global urban agendas to always look at these three lenses at the same time and not in isolation. And that's perhaps the best way because you are also uh, talking about integrated urbanism to, to get results. So uh, again, I'm not going to focus too much on this, but please keep this in mind. Failure of urban planning has impacts at these three levels. Now, the United Nations is not only about sustainable development. We are also, um, one of our pillars is also human rights. And then when you link urban planning with human rights, you're going very clear to a number of issues to do with adequate housing, uh, security of tenure, different dimensions of the place where people live. On the other hand, there has been a, a movement over the past years, which also come, culminated in recognition of this in the new urban agenda about the right to the city, which is a broader concept about fair distribution of the benefits that are created through urban development. Again, this is not codified as, it, as the right to adequate housing is, but it is a very important prospective right that you need to keep in mind and a good orientation to link urban planning with human rights. Finally, um, urban planning is also linked with, with crisis situations. Here you see um, a pictures from an, um, uh, a project that we are uh, running in Lebanon, uh, in different cities in Lebanon, where we're looking at migration and the increase of population because of migrants from Syria coming to um, Lebanon and how some neighborhoods are expanding exponentially over a very short time. And again, urban planning is clearly an answer. As migration happens more and more in urban settings, urban planning is an, is an answer to uh, accommodating migrants and integrating migrants in uh, the life of, of cities. And perhaps a very extreme example is some work that we did in Mosul in, in Iraq during the, um, the war where, again, urban planning methodologies were used through local universities, informants on site to build a picture of the damage that was done in the war. So again, urban planning as a discipline to mapping urban realities and then provide feedback for reconstruction after uh, a war situation. So I hope that this is um, clear enough to position um, uh, urban planning in the United Nations context. I want to end this introduction by, by also showing a picture of, of, Euro of Europe and its population densities, just to say that this is not only about developing countries, obviously. And these densities and the spread of densities, uh, which is um, a map developed by the European Commission, shows the spread of urban populations and made very visible how different countries in the European Union have more distributed or less distributed urbanism, which has consequences, obviously, for urban and, and sub-regional uh, plan. Also for the European Union, not as a development actor, but also as an um, as a regional um, internal um, engine of economic um, growth and prosperity. So now I would like to um, go through a number of um, milestones uh, that uh, have occurred over the past uh, recent years and um, position urban planning in this regard. So the, the big picture uh, milestones or big picture timeline starts in 76. I think most of you would perhaps know that um, the first Habitat One conference was, uh, took place there in Canada, in Vancouver, and with a focus on also the role of um, governments in and international organizations in housing, and UN Habitat was created soon thereafter. 20 years later in Istanbul, there was more emphasis on uh, the needs of cities, but the involvement of cities was still uh, very 
limited until Habitat 3 in uh, Quito 2016, when cities were really part and parcel of the preparation of this third conference. And uh, uh, through the policies that were developed in preparation of this conference, and also participation of more than a thousand local government actors at the conference itself, which resulted in the new urban agenda, which we'll discuss a bit further. So it is a it is a 40 year, more than 40 year timeline of of um, the history of human settlements in the United Nations. I get a bit more in detail some of the highlights um, of of the last section of this of this timeline. Uh, we had um, a World Open Forum in 2006 that had a very uh, strong uh, emphasis on reinventing urban planning. At that time, there was a, a recognition that urban planning was not always delivering on what a society expects. Um, gradually, over the past 10 years, there has been lots of emphasis on the linkage between urban planning and climate change, cities and climate change. Uh, which is uh, continuing up to date and, and will continue further until the, the Glasgow meet COP26 later, later this year, at least, so that we can see more countries that incorporate urban planning issues in their national determined contributions they're preparing for uh, the fifth year of the Paris um, Agreement. Another um, couple of highlights, and I think the, the Paris Agreement is perhaps one of the most influential and the most visible ones also in the media. And it's important because even if it's not binding, it comes up with national determined contributions which are traceable and monitorable. And we also do some work together with other actors to see to what extent these contributions from national level are including urban issues, urban planning issues as levers for addressing goals, national goals of climate uh, mitigation and, and adaptation. Then maybe more recently, we had the first UN Habitat Assembly in 2019, when there was a resolution on urban rural linkages, which actually put to end this um, false dichotomy between urban and rural planning and urban and rural spheres, emphasizing the connectivity between um, the, the two. And uh, maybe just to have one um, note on COVID-19, and I don't have much um, in my presentation, although as, um, as Astrid was saying, I've uh, currently, at the last um, six, seven months, worked a lot on this and we can discuss later. But there are very, very clear opportunities for urban planning to re-emerge as a very important element in the discussion of overcrowding, in the discussion of um, urban economy, proximity, etc., and we can discuss this this, this further. Uh, so these are some of the the highlights that we are we have seen, and all of these are linked to these global agreements that you see on the left side of your screen. Of course, there's also the financing uh, dimension, the Addis Ababa Agreement in 2015, and the resilience. Um, uh, Sendai uh, Accord in uh, 2015, which focuses also on local, local level action uh, campaign for disaster risk. The most important, uh, I think without doubt, and the, the more integrating um, element, there is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which I'm sure you know very well. With a very important uh, goal 11 on sustainable uh, cities and communities. It is a goal uh, which I have personally had the privilege to present our organization, UN Habitat, in, in leading our coordination and, and advocating for this goal together with many other organizations. But we're very happy that this is for the very first time in the development history is part of the, the picture. Yeah, it's only one out of 17, but it is part of the 17. It wasn't an easy um, an easy journey. Originally, there were, I think, 26 different options, and it narrowed down to 17, and we were able to advocate to keep cities and communities as one of these 17 goals. Now, within that goal, and that's where the urban planning comes out very, very strongly, there is 
much more than we had in the previous agenda, which were the Millennium Development Goals, um, which were agreed upon around the year 2000. And the ones that I have highlighted in orange are the ones that are directly, directly speaking to urban planning, um, uh, participatory planning, uh, the quality of participatory planning, the land use efficiency, the access to public space, the urban rural linkages uh, are directly, these are planning disciplines, but there are other like sustainable transport, of course, housing, um, climate change planning. These are very closely related to, to urban and uh, subnational uh, planning. So we're very happy with this, with this outcome. And of course, it is a, a huge task um, to, to implement uh, this agenda. The reason why it's such a ambitious task and a huge, huge task is that these are the, the three which I've lifted here are very new targets. These are targets that were totally unheard of in any of the Millennium Development Goals discussions. Um, I mean, why would one measure the participatory nature um, and the space use of planning, the efficiency of the space use? Why would one measure accessibility to green and public spaces and the safety of public spaces? And why would one measure to what extent there is an integration of urban and rural areas? So this, this required a lot of advocacy, but it also had a challenge then in the first years of implementing this plan, because we needed to develop indicators to measure each of these, uh, for each of these uh, targets. And that has happened, it took uh, some time, but now, uh, uh, last 10 years of the agenda, there are very specific indicators that are measuring um, samples of public spaces all over the world, or measuring more than 150 countries, uh, to what extent they're having a national urban policy and implementing it, and also are measuring the space use efficiency as cities are expanding, are they doing it using relative more space or relatively less space Per, per population. So all these um, uh, indicators can be discussed in more detail, data are being collected, and we have to do yearly progress reports on this SDG 11 for uh, member states to, uh, to consider. Now, SDG 11 is not um, obviously the only um, relevant uh, plan for urban development. There are many others, and I'm not going to spend too much time, but um, what you see on your screen are some and of course, I hope that these slides can then uh, be, be shared with everyone, that some of these um, other um, elements like land tenure, which is not part of SDG 11, but it is linked to um, urban poverty, the access to land tenure, um, uh, renewable energy, again, not part of SDG 11, but very closely related, and waste management is part of sustainable consumption and production, again, very closely related way that cities are are managed now uh, this culminated and so we're talking 2015 now 2016 barely one year later uh, the new urban agenda was adopted in, in quito with lots of mayors present and this agenda is more about the how not about the what but about the how it is an um, uh, outcome document of a united nations conference which looks at an implementation plan for the new urban agenda and looks at um, what member states commit to uh, how to implement this ambitious sustainable development goals specifically as they uh, relate to urban development. What you can see in the new urban agenda, it's a very uh, short document, it's 23 pages. Um, it's much shorter than the, the agendas coming out of, out of Habitat 1 and 2, but there are some very strong values that are promoted, indicating that member states should move from uh, urban sprawl to more compact development, from segregation to more integration, and from avoid congestion and, more, and move towards connectivity. These are values that were not captured with that great level of um, uh, firmness and uh, and and um, you know confidence in any of the previous uh, agendas. So to cap uh, this discussion, uh, yes, we are continuing to monitoring these agendas. 
but we're not doing this alone. On the bottom right of your screen, you see um, a dozen of agencies, uh, perhaps a bit more, that are implementing their own strategies related to sustainable urbanization. Um, FAO is working on food in urban area. Um, UNHCR is working on refugees. And we are working together with these agencies to make sure that these urban agendas are going in line with the philosophy that is behind the new urban um, agenda. So this is the, let me now uh, focus a little bit on the examples of our work and then conclude uh, my, my presentation. The examples of our work are uh, going to be um, trying to capture how you do this in practice, how urban planning can contribute to these agendas in practice. And of course, this is a very broad discussion, again, at different scale levels, as you can um, imagine. This is a picture of our, um, our office in, um, in Nairobi, our headquarters of our agency is in Nairobi, where we have reg regular meetings with member states and where we coordinate our global operations. But we also have um, um, opportunities uh, to work at the country and the regional level. Uh, maybe I should mention that we are not only working on our planning. As you can see in these uh, practice areas, urban planning and finance is just one out of five areas which are related but which are distinct. Land and housing, basic services, um, policy and legislation, and then human rights and social inclusion. So I'm now going to continue focusing on urban planning related to the work of UN Habitat specifically as the, the, the focal point of the United Nations on this. In terms of our regional presence, um, we are working in um, about 60 countries. And um, in terms of the volume of our work, currently the Arab states region, what is in green, is the biggest volume, followed by Africa, then Asia, then Latin America, and then Eastern uh, Europe. So this is the, the, the kind of the proportion with, with really the bulk um, of our operations spread between um, what you can see in green, in purple, and in orange. The rest is sometimes very high uh, quality advisory projects, but not so uh, large in scale. Um, now, focusing again back on what our urban planning um, work, where is it located? You can see here a world map with dots um, where the different types of urban planning work, where are they located? They're um, also distributed over these regions, maybe a little bit more in Latin America um, than, than our global portfolio. Sometimes we deal with uh, extending or advising governments on how to extend their cities, how to densify, how to um, reform their planning legislation and how to integrate climate change in, into planning. Now a few examples, um, and I'm going to take mainly examples from Africa and then Asia. Um, Ghana, Accra, capital city is um, expanding very rapidly. You can see the, the, how the, the dark red part of the map is expanding as you go to the right. And um, it, is, it is expanding with loss of density, meaning, yes, population is expanding, but the, the area of expansion is, is much faster than the population uh, increase, which leads to loss of density and missed opportunities for efficiency, for proximity, and for economic uh, productivity. So what we did in um, Ghana, and this is, with, is a presidential initiative, not so not only the, the, the region of the capital region, but beyond the president, head of state launched this, but we are working very closely, especially with the local authority that sits in between two of the urban centers, yeah, Accra and Tema, and then to the right, and that, that Ningo Pram Pram um, local authority or sub-regional authority is the, the, the host of an intervention that's a, a, planned, a planned city extension trying to structure un, unplanned urbanization and trying to, um, to, to bring more logic into it, more efficiency, 
and actually create a framework to receive rapid increase in population over the coming uh, decades. Uh, so this is a, a slightly more detailed, also very much taking into account the green infrastructure, green blue infrastructure uh, framework of that uh, relatively vulnerable area in between these two urban settings. Um, second example, Johannesburg, which is a much more developed, um, much more developed uh, part of um, African urbanism. Uh, however, with lots of challenges since um, South Africa became independent 25 years ago, um, there was a lot of uh, remaining um, inequality uh, as well as um, kind of uh, fragmentation of the urban fabric. Uh, you can see here a schematic map of the, the, the territory of Johannesburg as a, as a large city. Um, and then the projects that we advised uh, the local government to undertake to restitch this uh, territory in something that can start making sense again by advising on, on public transit, on unlocking some of the um, elements that, that haven't been exploited sufficiently as urban development areas, and also connecting Soweto as a true um, urban uh, district. Now, again, this is done in a participatory process with different groups of people from the local authority, private sector, universities, communities, and then uh, developing a long-term framework um, that was 2015 to 2040, to uh, organize the spatial development of uh, Johannesburg. Of course, implementation is key. Regulation to support this implementation and financing is absolutely key to this. Um, and you can see here uh, some further um, uh, illustration how this sustainable uh, or this spatial development framework is, is linked with these values that I've emphasized earlier, this connectivity, integration, inclusivity, compactness, and climate uh, resilience. Just uh, one example, a quick example from our home city here, which is showing how urban planning has an immediate impact on employment opportunities. And you see a schematic map of Nairobi and showing that people who are using public transit, how few um, uh, parts of the city can be reached within one hour of public transit. Matatu means the local bus system. Uh, by car, it's a little bit different. You can reach a bit further, but it is it is a very inefficient city in terms of um, uh, transportation, which has an immediate impact on job opportunities that uh, someone would be able to reach. Another uh, example from Kenya, and this is to bring in this migration dimension. We have been spearheading uh, a movement within the United Nations and the humanitarian community to move from camps to cities, meaning instead of building camps, trying to build new settlements or to use existing settlements to expand into, um, into uh, uh, new, um, in this case, Kalobeye, it's a new city of 60,000 in, in inhabitants in Kenya, in the north of Kenya, in a very low, densely populated area but uh, ensuring that there is mixity between host and, and uh, migrant populations. When migrants would leave at one day, and this is already, they have been in Kenya for, uh, for more than two decades, but once they would leave, you would have a seamless transition. You would be able to keep the infrastructure and uh, the buildings and everything, and then uh, have a, a very quick investment into um, a, a fully mixed that urban development pattern in the north that would be strategically located. And this is something that UNHCR is trying to promote now in other parts of the world as well. Uh, now, a few quick ones about Asia before uh, concluding. Um, this is Myanmar. And here I just want to say that sometimes we don't go city by city. Here we had um, an assignment for the whole country with the Ministry of Construction, and you develop then guidelines to um, inform local authorities with principles on how to uh, develop, how to densify, et cetera, uh, how to include greenery into urban uh, development, not for a specific city, but for all the secondary cities of the country. 
This is um, an interesting uh, example in China, Chengdu. And I mention it because we actually this month we received a prize, um, the first prize of China's urban planning projects uh, for the Park City Indicator System. And uh, the, what we did with uh, the municipality of Chengdu is to create um, an, uh, an, a park system around this very large city um, of more than 10 million inhabitants. Um, so a park structure with different types of functions that is um, uh, enacted in law and that would allow the city to densify more easily without sprawling and also um, have um, uh, leisure and uh, produ productive agriculture uh, land within reach for all the, the residents of this of this large uh, city. Um, the last example is related to climate change. Climate change is now integrated in all our work, but this one is specifically 100% focused on climate change. It is in um, Vanuatu, a very vulnerable um, uh, country, um, small island states where we are working on climate adaptation measures. And again, this is working with the, the city, but then also developing normative guidance for, for other cities, not only in, in this part of the world, but uh, also elsewhere. So this is in summary, um, the work that we have been doing over the past years. I'm not going into the detail, but the scale is in the hundred. We're talking about working with a hundred cities, but of course uh, we have more than 4,000 cities in, in the world that have more than 100,000 inhabitants. So we are touching a small part of the reality, but we are trying to be to have sufficient that our work can be demonstrated at scale. Um, we also have, of course, as I said, uh, extracted learnings from the different projects, uh, developing international guidelines, stories, case studies on different parts, on migrants, on the green economy, on the green economy elements, on the integration of urban and rural areas, and many more, which of course are available on our website and free uh, to use and to adapt and to translate if, if needed. Um, we also have other work, which I'm not going to focus, that is on the data, the global trends monitoring, which is another division, um, which deals not so much with the implementation, but with the monitoring of the new urban agenda and these reports uh, about progress and trends that I've been uh, talking about. Finally, a few uh, concluding uh, remarks. Um, so some of the things that we have learned, and I'm sure this is quite familiar to um, students, is the need, and I've tried to illustrate that in a few cases, but one would need to go deeper in each of these cases, is the need to connect different space uh, levels. Um, this is obvious for us urban planners and uh, designers, but not always obvious for our interlocutors. So it's very important to emphasize the interconnectivity between these scales. And if you get an assignment to work at one scale, that also the other scales are taken into account and connected. The other uh, lesson is, of course, the horizontal integration. And while I've been speaking 90% uh, of this time on urban planning. What we have come to learn is that urban planning without connectivity to legislation and finance is always going to be very, very difficult to implement. So since 2014, in our strategic plan, we have always tried to integrate within the same projects elements of planning and design, legislation, urban legislation, reform, and um, urban economy, which is often land-based land urban economy, uh, municipal finance, uh, own-based, um, let's say, own uh, resources that be generated at the, at the city level. Finally, um, this is our current strategic plan, and this is to show you that we have learned from this last um, several years of working in this way, in the current strategic plan that started last year, if you, if you look at the titles in the four different colors, they really deal with issues that are not so much, you won't see urban planning there, you won't see urban legislation. You will see reduced inequality, 
you'll see shared prosperity, climate action, and, and uh, urban crisis prevention, which means these are higher goals of the United Nations. These are not just goals for a technical agency, but we are contributing to these higher goals through our urban planning practice and other practices. We also have set up a number of uh, flagship programs that are contributing, but this is just the very beginning, uh, focusing on adaptation in informal settlements, focusing on smart cities, but inclusive smart cities um, as a new topic uh, for our work and uh, many other things I could uh, discuss uh, and answer questions about um, uh, as we move forward. Uh, final slide. Um, these are some of the, I would say, the takeaway messages of this presentation. We have seen an enormous revival of confidence in urban planning over the past years, especially in the past five years. It's codified in global agreements. Um, the, the values are more universally accepted, the values that we need to achieve with urban planning, but much, much more has to be done to implement these agendas, um, especially after this uh, year of COVID-19, which has set us back, all of us, in, in any development work that has happened. So I'll leave it here and thank you very much and looking forward to the, the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Raf, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I think it gave us a very good overview, both on your strategic thoughts, uh, as well as on how does it actually look like on the ground, giving us examples of how uh, the work of your habitat materializes in different contexts and under different themes. Um, I think before we uh, go over to the discussion, you will see, Raf, there's already a lot of comments and questions in the chat. Um, you might want to stop uh, the sharing of presentation. Yeah, here we go. And what I would suggest now to all the audience, if you just um, want to state a comment or question, mark this in the chat. I will now, I think it's a good idea that if I go now into the chat, because there's so various comments, that I hand over to that particular student so that you also get a bit of a feel who is with you in this digital room. And um, first, Girisha um, stated a question which relates to the three lenses about um, sustainability, the economic, social and environmental aspects you raised. Girisha, you want to state the question to Raf by yourself so that he can see you as well? Here we go. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon from Germany. And thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it is a common interest between the students of MIP and IUST, and it was very interesting to know how the work is organized over the many years and how it comes to ground through implementation examples. Um, my question to you came when you were talking about failures of urban planning through the three lenses of social, economic, and environmental. And while we take this triple bottom line framework, uh, to assess the good and the bad impacts and scope for intervention, I was uh, trying to ask how culture and the area of cultural sustainability contributes as the fourth dimension for this framework and how sometimes it could get missed out when we look at the socio-economical and environmental alone in both ends, how the good can be implemented and the failures are seen because especially now with globalization and internationalization, if that is the right word, and the flattening of global cultures have impact not only on the social, economical, environmental aspect, but very evidently on the cultural aspects of, you know, of different places of the world and how now culture could contribute to this framework, which is otherwise a three-legged framework for understanding it also holistically and as a response to the globalization and the impact on urban planning and architecture therein. Should I respond directly? Yeah. Or, yes, yeah. Okay, yes. Thank you. I think it's a very good question. It's a very fundamental question. Um, of course, we would like to say we would like to stick in our in our framework to the three pillars of um, economic social and environmental but 
always emphasizing the the governance and culture dimension as cross-cutting over these three. And it is without any doubt, I think some of the examples um, are very clear that if you're working in um, uh, in the, 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 the Chinese example, uh, it's an issue of culture and governance. You can implement such a project in China, you will not be able to implement it in, um, in, in very, I mean, maybe only in very few other countries in the world. So that means it's not just a matter of the environment, the, the economy and the social, it is fundamentally an issue of culture and accessibility, acceptance of regulation and eh, through culture, but also uh, the governance system that makes it possible to have such an ambitious project um, implemented. The, the second example I would like to give, and I'm going to use the same examples, uh, the, the example of the Northern Kenya um, uh, migrants, um, you know, the, the culture, you can imagine, this is these are nomadic people who are settling in a camp and now uh, we are asking them to settle in an, um, in a kind of emerging settlement. So in the design, and I have not shown you design uh, slides, uh, but in the design, of course, you need to take into account that each of these households and families can continue with some of the activities that they uh, are, are engaged in. Um, and, and one of the, the things there specifically is that the design of that uh, large scheme is taking into account the migration routes of the cattle through this uh, scheme. The traditional migration routes are taken into account when designing the three blocks that are in this Calobeye settlement. So definitely it is extremely important, culture is important and governance is, is, is very important. But we would not go as far as saying they should become the fourth and the fifth pillar because we try to nurture um, this um, this very firm. This was started in 1972. So, you know, we are talking about almost uh, 50 years after Stockholm. It's going to be celebrated next year. So we don't want to question and say, no, this is not valid. Huh? You see, it's better to say there are other dimensions that need to be looked at and demonstrate how to do it rather than to say these three dimensions are not are not solid enough. I mean, I hope you understand what I mean. Yes, right. And thank you for mentioning traditional patterns in your example, because my question was coming from the uh, lens of how uh, vernacular cultures contribute to the framework of sustainability. So thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, Raf, there is another question which was also actually on my mind uh, relating to the aspect of indicators and data availability. Uh, and uh, it is Linda who is posing this in the chat. And I would like to hand over to Linda uh, for your question. Yeah, thank you, Astrid. And uh, thank you so much for this presentation and your insights. It was really interesting. And I became very curious when you were talking about the measurement of the SDGs. Uh, and I'm actually currently developing my master thesis under the umbrella of um, target uh, seven, uh, target, yeah, target seven public spaces. So I'm wondering how can the implementation of the SDG targets in cities of the global south be measured since uh, many of them consist of large areas um, that are informal. So, yeah. Maybe taking this example of public spaces, how can they in uh, be measured in informal areas? Like, are they measured? Um... Yeah. Let me, yeah, let me explain in detail. I happen to, to know sufficient about that. Um, let me first say there are two indicators for uh, the, um, the uh, target seven. One is the access to public space and second is um the um, sexual or gen gender-based violence in public spaces so the second one is dealt with unifem and they have their methodology we are dealing with the first one which is the access uh, to public space so what we do and of course this is not comprehensive you take a sample you take a country let's say a country that has um uh, 50 uh, intermediary cities then you take a sample that is representative. Maybe five of these cities are identified uh, so the, that they show the different may, maybe geographic areas, the scale level, so that you have a good overview. And then we, within each of these five, uh, you identify 
um, a number of typical uh, neighborhoods with public spaces. So you're not going to say the city has 25 neighborhoods, so we're going to go each of these neighborhoods. No, you're going to start with maybe three neighborhoods, uh, an informal neighborhood, a very formal neighborhood, and, and um, a peri-urban expanding neighborhood. And you're going to then look at the access to public space in these three. Then you're looking at, do we need a fourth neighborhood to, to show the diversity? Maybe you need one more or you need five, but probably with five neighborhoods, you're capturing the, the gist of the city. And then you move into these neighborhoods and take a sample of public space and then measure through surveys, through geospatial data, different elements of access. Some of them you can measure by looking at it from the sky, others you can measure through doing surveys, um, looking at, for instance, also safety, lighting, quality of public. So you see, by making a, as an informed sample, you can go fairly deep into this uh, question and then come up with an, um, a measure of accessibility of public space in a certain city and then a certain country. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. I think that gave Linda very concrete guidelines how to move yeah. forward with her master thesis. Uh, Raf, um, in the chat, Cesar poses a question which is more related to the situation of informal settlements which are exposed to um, cyclical uh, natural events like flooding and what could be uh, responses to that. I, I would hand over to Cesar to briefly state his question. Hello. Hello, Professor. Hello. Hi. Yes, I'm talking about this is a problem that is in my home country, Paraguay, and I think all South America suffering and in a lot of other developed countries is about the cyclical problem with flooding and the government policies are not uh, finding a way to take this informal settlements to other places because of culture and problems and they find a way to evacuate then when the flooding happens and then they come back in those places i want to know if there were uh, cases that you can help and find a way to give some solutions to those problems okay um let me try to answer in two different ways one is the specific um, issue of uh, uh, flooding, and we have developed some guidance for uh, local governments together with an uh, institute in the Netherlands, uh, in Enschede, um, and this is uh, focusing on how to decide which areas with informal settlements are um, can cannot continue to be settled and which ones can can continue to be settled with some infrastructural um, or other, other types of adaptation. So you have to distinguish with some areas that shouldn't have been settled in the first place and others that can be uh, accommodated within the urban frame. So there is some guidance on how to do this, how to map this, and then also how to put this in practice um, through, through planning and gradual uh, planning. And there will be some relocation, but it will not be a kind of uh overall relocation it will be maybe 10 percent of the the people will be relocated depending on the situation because in some cases you can simply not maintain human settlement in an area that becomes a um, a drain or becomes a, a, a flash flood it's simply too dangerous um now specifically for asuncion we have a program that deals with uh, resilience mapping and um, it's, a, it's a global program, and uh, if you want, I could put you in touch with the leader of that program. And I know that they are working with the local government in Asuncion, as well as um, a number of other cities in the world, on the strengthening the data systems in the city to, to, to be prepared for any type of disaster. Could be, it could be um, uh, something like flooding, it could be... Um, uh, economic decline. I mean, there are different types of setbacks, but we are believing that a kind of generic approach 
based on data and evidence can help the local local authorities uh, respond to to crisis in the city so if you send me um, a message i can then uh, connect you and then probably um, point you to some more information on asuncion specific Thanks for that great offer <laughs> to Cesar. Raf, um, uh, I already said in the beginning there might be students particularly uh, interested in um, your current work on COVID-19. And there's actually two comments in the chat which are asking for more information on this idea of 15-minute cities. Uh, Praveen and uh, Tafikal are uh, asking about that. Maybe Praveen, can you just state your question in more detail? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, actually, I came to know there is uh, the Paris mayor and some other uh, uh, major city mayor, they're talking about a 15 minute city. So I would uh, like to have more information on that. And as a follow up, uh, one more question I have put in, actually it's related to the transit oriented development. So in India, our government has taken this as a major uh, policy decision, but our cities are very much crowded, like Mumbai and all the density is very high, and Delhi also the density is very high. So how can we implement uh, directly transfer Western concepts directly into India? Because um, the existing, how we will manage the existing people to go out and uh, so whether it is feasible. Uh, so these are the two questions. And then there is another, any other uh, uh, concept or framework uh, based on mixed use development, uh, which will solve the problem means solve the problem the need to travel like for example university of stuttgart uh, faculty and uh, students if they stay around the university area then there is no need to commute so is there any frameworks like that this is my question thank you okay on um, the first question um you know this is uh, i would say fairly new the mayor of paris introduced this actually before COVID 19 um and it has it has become more relevant during the pandemic actually it's the i think she is referring to the 20 minute city meaning you need to be able to access key elements in your city within 20 minutes but the 15 minute neighborhoods that means within 15 minutes you should be able with a bus or with a walking distance uh, to get to all the essential places within um, a neighborhood and then some um, some cities are bringing this down to the one minute street where you can within one minute or two minutes or five minutes have as access to the essential services that um, of meeting neighbors and and grocery stores and other other um, also emergency uh, functions that the city has to offer so i think this this concept because of the pandemic is going to uh, gain traction and in fact we are um, coming up with a new publication by the end of next month and it is looking at um, basically looking at cities and pandemics to, uh, towards a more uh, just, a more green and a more healthy future. And it will look, one of the chapters, the four main chapters, one of the chapters is looking at the spatial shape of the cities and looks at this concept of 15 minute cities and what are the implications. So please look out for that publication. Um, and then uh, from there you'll see, um, but this is very much evolving eh? because I'm sure that also there are limitations to this and that we need to you know we need to be critical some of these um the, the, these concepts are are extremely good and necessary but we need to look at all angles and sometimes it's very difficult for existing cities that are monofunctional to transform into such mixed neighborhoods yeah? which which is for us definitely the ideal but to re engineer it afterwards is sometimes very difficult. Imagine schools and hospitals that are sometimes concentrated on in, in one part of the city, how to redistribute that, which is essential for this concept. It's not, not that easy um, at all. Um, so uh, look out for that publication. On the TOD, the Transit Oriented Development in India or elsewhere, um, I think it has been um, an, um, an important uh element of the uh, indeed addressing mobility but also addressing uh, climate change mitigation in in cities through through sustainable mobility um it's uh the world bank is pushing it quite quite strongly um we are seeing one drawback 
nothing wrong with it in principle, but is the, the, the enormous transformation and gentrification that is happening in these neighborhoods that are identified as the, the centers or as the or the, or the streets or the, the, the kind of, yeah, the, it's smaller than a neighborhood, but it's a, a part of a city that suddenly becomes the home of a transit point and where the land values are rapidly increasing and automatically pushing out the weaker uh, segments of the population and sometimes pushing them out to an uh, undesirable part of the, of the city. So you're solving the problem for uh, the middle income and the wealthy, but you're not necessarily having a solution unless you integrate affordable housing very, very strongly into the TOD model. Without that, I think it is going to be very challenging. Over. Yeah, thanks. Thanks also for this critical view on sometimes, um, I think, examples which are um, a lot shared also amongst students and so as, as possible avenues and ideas and that one also needs maybe to counterbalance negative effects going along with these kinds of interventions. And I think uh, the example of Johannesburg, which you shared, is a good example for both the aspects you raised, Yeah, how to initiate mixed use in cities which have been created on different ideas, as well as the effects of TOD in that case. Um, I, I would like to move on with um, uh, a question raised in the chat by Diana. She was very interested um, that the urban rural linkages, um, uh, that this became now a more prominent topic. And I would hand over to Diana to state her question. You Astrid, uh, good afternoon and thank you for your lecture. It was super interesting. And as I was saying, it is very exciting for me to know that now the UN has already included this link between rural and urban um, as part of uh, its agenda. And now that you um, include rural development in your radar, I was thinking how we can uh, include this topic as part of this comprehensive uh, urban planning um, as an influential factor to slowing down the pace of migrations from the countryside to the city. Because for, for instance, in Colombia, uh, one of the biggest um, reasons for this kind of migrations, of course, is violence, but uh, it's also the lack of opportunities to develop uh, in the countryside, especially for young people. So I was thinking how we could address this uh, rural side of the problem inside of this huge topic that is uh, integrated that we are talking about. Yeah, a very good question. And indeed, we, we have uh, for the last, especially for the last uh, two, three years, very strongly new emphasis on that. It's of course, it's an, it's it's one of these more difficult issues to implement. It is something that is right, can only be gradually implemented across a territory. But one of the ways, and you see what we are, when we're doing this urban rural linkages, we're looking at these linkages and the strength of the linkages for this, uh, some of the linkages are to do with employment, as you say, but others to do with food systems, food security, or with uh, environmental uh, issues that are provoking um, movements. But one of the, not the solution, but one of the solutions is investing in small and um, intermediary cities. Uh, for us, this is something very important. Um, to invest means uh, not just um, physical infrastructure, but also um, uh, have an explicit policy to distribute employment opportunities like university, uh, faculties, etc., in such cities and distribute that over the country or encourage um, uh, private sector enterprises to invest um, in, uh, in, in cities that have not enjoyed. And that, that can uh, engender um, a dynamics of strengthening those cities and then, um, uh, of course, avoid the need to move from, you still need to move from rural areas to small towns, but maybe not any anywhere beyond. That's a simplistic um, picture, but I think it's, uh, you can't go much wrong in, in putting high quality investment in, in secondary cities 
it has an enormous development uh, benefit. Of course, it has to be coupled with uh, a kind of devolution and power of these uh, cities to also uh, raise their own revenue. They should not simply be dependent on some top-down investments, but they should have a sustainable way to raise their revenue through land um, and, other, and other services. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm turning now to a question by Melvina. Um, she's more interested in governance aspects and it reminded me, you might not recall it, Raf, but ages ago when I was working on my PhD, I contacted you because of stakeholders um, in the housing process in Cape Town and it was about STI in South Africa and your comment was, these are moving targets. Um, and I like that a lot, it stayed a lot in my mind. And Melvina is interested in this aspect of how to include stakeholders in planning processes. I, I would hand over to you, Melvina. Thank you, Astrid. Uh, hi, Astrid. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's interesting to show some of the projects that you and Habitat have done uh, in Ghana and another. I'm so interested, based on your experience, to involve in urban planning projects that would be the best method to deal with this many stakeholder into the practice because some of the expertise will be coming from uh, the outside uh, country of the place. So how you to deal with the different stakeholder interests on the process? I mean, with the method or with the strategy you have done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melvina. Let me give you an example of a project that I have not discussed and it's very, it's fairly recent, it's the last two, three years, which is supported by the UK FCO, the, the United uh, um, Kingdom uh, Foreign Office, essentially. And they have given us a grant to work in um, 19 cities um, across the world in typically middle income uh, cities. And our role was to link the local government with the financiers, the kind of possible uh, in infrastructure investment shares in, in the country and beyond the country. And so this is just one element of bringing, um, bringing uh, people together. And it's all about, for us, the task was bringing them together for what? And the, the challenge that we put it is bringing them together to make sure that the investment is contributing more to the implementation of the SDGs locally. So you see, that's turning a, an opportunity into a development achievement. So for instance, if you are um, in, in a city in uh, Indonesia or in a city in, um, in uh, Vietnam, you have an investment related to uh, development of a city lake or an, um, a transport system, you're kind of looking at it, not just looking strictly at the feasibility of the investment, and then the, the capability of the local government to repay the, 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 the loan, for instance. But you're looking at what are the quantifying, and that's why data indicators are important, which, on which sustainable development goals is this going to impact? And how can you predict over the next 10 years, for instance, the impact of this investment on uh, specific SDGs, including difficult SDGs, such as inequality, um, but others that are more easily measured, like um, uh, renewable energy, etc. So, and that's a very useful, uh, we have developed a tool for that. It's like an SDG assessment tool for urban investment projects. And um, it's being used now, not only in these 19 cities, but beyond. So I would say we can, we can talk more, of course, about participation and how, how to organize this, but I would say, let it be purposeful and let the participants and the stakeholders know that we are doing this not just for the sake of it, we're doing it for an outcome that everyone wants and that we can, we have different variants of a certain investment, but depending on what you choose, you have a different uh, development or sustainable development um, outcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, Raf, there's still a question also by Alfred in the chat uh, uh, around the design laboratories. Alfred, can you state your question yourself? Yeah, hi, good day everyone and thank you so much for the presentation. We definitely have a lot of information to process. 
And um, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about the design laboratories, because I'm interested in to how this process was carried out in the different cities. And I want to know if there is a particular methodology and if this methodology is related to the methodology of uh, the Inter-American Bank development, which is design lab. And yes, I basically I want to know what are, what are the main goals of these um, laboratories in the cities. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, and indeed we started our lab, our uh, urban lab in uh, 2014, I guess, or 2013. Uh, so it's seven year old and we have evolved and, and try to make it more integrated, but it wasn't uh, for us. And I think it's similar um, with, um, with other organizations and development banks. Um, it is a way to, to make sure that an, um, an, an, an relationship, relationship gets all the opportunities of, um, of uh, innovation, let's say urban planning, urban design innovation that it deserves by bringing different people together at the city level, which is now a little bit more difficult um, because of uh, restrictions, because of COVID-19, but in a in a kind of working way, in a kind of charrette type of working within a week, starting within a week to, to, to discuss how um, a certain problem that comes on the table can be addressed in an, in an integrated way, in a multidisciplinary way. And um, through, through design, through different to comparing different design alternatives to a certain a certain aimed um, objective by the mayor or by the local uh, government, and we have um, we have uh, done this. And and the example I just gave to um, to uh, Melvina was actually similar. It's a methodology of design labs, but in some cases, Habitat plays a direct role as an actor, as a planner, almost. Eh? A planner together with local planners, but as an active uh, responsibility to deliver a product. In other cases, we take a step back and we are more of a facilitator between different actors, um, um, like I said, investors and local governments or other uh, actors. Um, uh, the, the, what uh, Astrid said about SDI is a is a very relevant situation also because in many cases the 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 voices of communities and the voices of informal settlement communities are not the ones that are definitely strongest um, in design um, alternatives. And, and you need, again, different methodologies to make these voices heard and valued and integrated um, in a proper way. And um, in the country where we live and in India, there is a lot of um, experience uh, in this. Uh, in this in, in different methodologies of empowering uh, local communities to have voice in in design uh, processes so this is i think for us is now part and parcel of our work but not just since the last five years probably probably we started with this in the in the 90s or in the 80s in the late 80s already with the community development program so for us it's almost like an automatic thing but for some of the newer players in the urban field, it is a new discovery eh? that you don't go in a city like you go in when you develop a road, an, in, an intercity road. It's a fundamentally different approach towards engagement and participation. But for some banks and for some, um, for some uh, newcomers in the urban arena, it is a learning, a learning process. And we sometimes support banks in designing that element of their intervention. Over. Thanks, Thank Alvin. you. Thank you so much. There, there's a final question in the chat, although I'm not sure if that's something you can directly respond to. Jamil is asking about the role of the UN in Mosul City. Jamil, uh, you, you want to quickly pose it and we see if there's a response for that now. I'm not sure if Jamil is still with us, maybe not. Um, then well, most I, of I can say a few words, but it is, um, you know, it is the, the reason why I use this example, because it's an extreme example. And it shows it shows how, how Habitat or the UN 
or urban planning can still be relevant in situations of extreme, extreme violent conflict through very different means, through informal, almost infiltration um, of the, um, the neighborhoods and, and having people walking around when there's no bombs and then through their um, smartphones, feeding the information to a local university who then maps it out and then shares it and with Habitat and um, um, you know, investment or um, humanitarian agencies that are um, uh, fixing water pipes or water plants, etc. So it's a very, it's urban planning at the, um, at the edge of, of conflict. And we, that's the role we played in Mosul quite successfully. And in fact, we, this was documented and it was seen as a very, um, because, you know, very relevant. Many people would ask the question, why even uh, doing urban planning in Mosul? The city is being bombed. No, but you see, while it's being bombed already, there's a role for urban planners to think about um, immediate support for reconstruction of certain uh, infrastructure elements. Over. Yeah, uh, a final question from the chat comes from Franziska Schreiber. Franziska, can you state it, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Astrid, and thank you, uh, Raf, for uh, again for being here. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and and thank you also for highlighting the role and relevance for uh, of global agendas, including the the Agenda 2030 and the new urban agenda for urban planning on the one hand, but also in terms of the appreciation of, of cities as, as key arenas and, and actors for sustainable development. I was, uh, my question is a little bit related to the, to, to the point of, of the COVID-19 and to what extent it reveals any also thematic gaps in these global agendas and if so, which? And also what option exists now um, to, to integrate such aspects in uh, the global discourse? Because um, my, my question points a little bit at, at also the long-term vision of these global agendas and having, for example, the Habitat 3 conferences every 20 years. And now we are experiencing this disruption. So what opportunities also exist to, to include uh, current experiences and, and, and perhaps also uh, new and emerging issues they reveal? Thank you, Francisca. No, this is a very valid question. Um, but what we have seen, and I'm going to, I think we have a few minutes to, to elaborate a little bit on this question. Um, what we have learned through the COVID is that, yes, there are new issues, but actually you can bring them back to some of the issues that are already raised in the global agendas. And I'm talking now about the human settlements dimension of of the pandemic. And I'm just going to give you four, we have identified four areas. One is, um, which I have already uh, mentioned a little bit related to the 15 minute neighborhood, is the need to, um, to look at um, the, the spatial um, shape of cities and new centralities, the issue of centrality and decentralization in a spatial way has to be has to be looked at much more carefully. But you will recognize that this is something that was already addressed in the new urban agenda, but maybe not in the context of a pandemic, not in the context of health, but in the context of climate change, perhaps um, maybe mobility and um, efficiency. So you see, there there, there are existing um, solutions that get a new value through the pandemic. Another one uh, could be um, the, um, the issue of um, uh, the moratorium on, um, on uh, rent or on eviction. And this is something that is very important. It's a very good way of um, alleviating the, the, the challenges of people who are thrown out of their apartments because of the lack of employment during a situation where you cannot go to work. So we are studying now how legally these moratoriums could be extended and be made more flexible in some situations so that you can actually avoid this massive, um, massive um, uh, 
displacement and, and deepening of poverty to uh, throwing people out of their uh, residence. Let me try, and then maybe the, the last one is about governance. Uh, and I think we have a, a very, very good analysis of the different measures that the subnational governments and the local governments are taking in the pandemic. Who takes what decision when? What is the speed of this decision? What is the legal framework in allowing a local government to close, to lock down? And so that's analyzed and it feeds back to inter governmental relationships, which is already an element of the new urban agenda, of other agendas related to subsidiarity. So these are just a few elements that have come up, but I don't think we need a new agenda for that. I think we just need to use the solutions that exist and refine them um, and, and make them and show them how they will contribute to possible new stresses and new crises, either pandemics or other types of crises. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for highlighting that because I also think often the pandemic just maybe makes us more aware of, of certain issues which were there already before. Um, and I think particularly uh, the role of um, uh, spatial proximity uh, is now being understood from a different lens as well. Um, Raf, we are coming towards the end of our discussion and time, but you see a very engaged discussion. Um, it, I, I really have to thank you that you took the time to not only present to us, but to, to give us answers to, to the many questions we have. Um, for sure, from my side, I'm also interested to see how can the work of universities be, be more relevant or be more interlinked to what also UN Habitat does for the students themselves. There's sometimes questions like how can we do a master thesis in the framework of uh, uh, projects you are doing or internships. Uh, I'm not sure if that's something we can touch upon now or maybe something because I wouldn't like this to be a once of engagement with you. Uh, maybe a, a discussion we, we, we can continue on the basis we have um, laid today. Um, one small question would be you offered that you uh, students could address you for a report or so. I'm not sure if we should share your email address or if I should be the channel for these kinds of questions and then would forward that for you. Would that be your preference? Okay, that's okay. Yeah? yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And of course, I, cannot, I will not be able to answer all the questions. I mean, I was lucky perhaps to that you made questions that are... Um, within my reach, but of course there are such a broad topic and there will be many questions, but let me answer or try to answer the question on university collaboration mm -hmm. and internships. Um, we have well, different types of, of engaging with universities. Some, some of it is um, ad hoc. That means we need a study or we commission a study or we do a collaboration or we need a university to help us with a, an um, publication or a process. Uh, that happens all the time. Um, preferably the universities that are closest to the, the context, um, obviously, but sometimes also um, international uh, universities for major studies and for um, uh, engagement. Um, we also have um, a framework called Habitat Uni, which is um, a framework of universities, I think about 200 of them, which are coming together to do things together, meaning uh, to develop joint curriculum, for instance, on cities and climate change. This has happened in the past. Um, there are other types of curricula that they have done. Um, I would say it's not the best resource part of Habitat, so it's struggling a little bit with financing, but it is, it is a good opportunity. Uh, it's managed by our capacity development unit, and um, there's a lot of prospects to engage, but I think you have your own your other direct networks. Obviously, we are not the best placed in coordinating that, I think, but we have done it because we believe it's important. But there are other university networks that are much more powerful and uh, go much deeper. And finally, there's internships. We have indeed an um, internship program, which is quite active. Um, and this could be internships at headquarters, in the regional offices, 
uh, sometimes in larger projects uh, where we have many staff, not in small projects, because that would be, we do not want to have interns working like on their own, on their thesis without uh, good uh, supervision. Um, what, uh, there are some restrictions. Maybe the first restriction is it's a non-paid internship. But it is also restricted because it can only be done during the master um, study and one year after the master study or after the PhD, during the PhD and one year after the PhD. But you cannot do it like 10 years after you have finished any relationship with university. It is between two and six months and you, you can see if you go to the UN Habitat um, portal, or the UNON portal, I can, I can share with you the details. Um, you can then see all the open vacancies, and there are many. Uh, some of them are in Nairobi. Of course, now internships are also from home yeah, up to now, but that will hopefully open up later in the year. And But it's very important to have very good supervision, and I don't want to, you know, encourage um, interns, um, you know, to do routine tasks. I think an intern needs to have needs to come and yes, get to learn what the Un United Nations is all about, but also um, uh, contribute uh, to one of our um, projects, one of our studies, etc. and have an active learning. That's very important, but it's possible. It's definitely possible. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that at the end, Raf. Um, so now we are coming to the end. I think I speak for everybody now uh, that this was for us a very important engagement uh, and very insightful. Um, and I would now hand over to Flat, who has or who will make a final announcement as part of the the kind of lecture series. Thank you, Raf. Thank you, thank you so much to both of you, uh, to Ralph for the wonderful presentation and uh, to Astrid for uh, moderating it. And uh, I have a brief and exciting and at the same time a little bit sad mission to announce that uh, uh, today was our last event within the uh, IUD lecture series this semester. But I am sure that we will come up with the uh, new ideas of how to develop the format because for all of us it was a sort of experiment. We moved as the whole world, we moved uh, to online, trying to also uh, attract different audiences. That's what I would also like to emphasize. I think the, the, the beautiful outcome of this uh, lecture series is that we expanded our networks so that we had students on board, but also those people outside of uh, Uni Stuttgart or uh, even academia uh, represented other parts of the world and other networks. So I'd like to thank therefore to Connections who supported us with promoting uh, IUS lectures this semester and the great audience we had, very engaged, very interested, and I'm sure that's a very insightful outcome of this uh, experiment, as I said. So thanks again to all of the speakers. We had a wonderful journey throughout different contexts, starting from uh, Amsterdam through uh, African cities, uh, Indian cities, and uh, the, the, the Singapore and the global perspective and the uh, perspective on the role of the planning and planners. So I think that was a wonderful combination of, of, of different uh, viewpoints and different topics we discussed. So thanks again for being with us. Uh, stay tuned. We will come back with the uh, announcement of uh, what and uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, some of the uh, lectures, they will be available online. So uh, uh, we'll think how to spread this information. Some of them are already uh, uploaded to the uh, K1 TV uh, YouTube channel, which Astrid mentioned at the beginning. So yeah, stay tuned, let's be in touch and thank you so much uh, for being with us. For me, the opportunity to thank also Flat because he really put up his sleeves to make this possible to transfer IUSD lectures to the digital format. Thanks for all your support in that regard. Greetings to Nairobi um, and Raf, we hope we stay in touch um, and all the others also. Have a good day still. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.